Hey there, my name's Gary Sims, and this is Gary Explains. Now, one of the interesting things about the Raspberry Pi Pico is that the processor it uses, the RP2040, has something called programmed I.O. And that's basically a way of controlling the general input-output pins, the GPIO, using hardware rather than software. So inside of the RP2040, there are in fact eight other small processors, state machines we would call them, that are dedicated to being able to manipulate the input and output pins in a hardware precise manner. It's not just software when it gets round to it, but based on a very strict clock routine, which is great when you want to do high speed communication with the outside world. So put it another way, there are eight little processors inside of the uh, RP2040 that you can program using assembly language. And this video is all about it. Programmed I.O. on the Raspberry Pi Pico. If you want to find out more, please let me explain. Okay, so to really understand how to program the uh, PIO, the state machines inside the Raspberry Pi Pico, you need to understand how they are made. Now, they're not like general purpose processors. You can't be, you know, doing, you know, uh, adds and branches and multiplying and write, you know, th these have got a very limited instruction set specifically for doing something with the GPIO pins. Now, basically what you've got is you have an input queue, call it a FIFO, first in, first out. That means if you send one, two, three down the queue, then one, two, three comes out the other end. That's different to a LIFO or a stack, which uh, is not used in this case, a very different uh, thing. So a FIFO, what goes in the queue is in the order that it comes out. You have another queue for sending things out back to the real world, so you can back to your program that's running on your Raspberry Pi Pico. You've got some scratch registers, X and Y, that you can load values into them and kind of use them for doing loop counting. And then you have a way of shifting data across to the pins or reading them from the pins using the uh, output shift register or the input shift register. And then of course there's an actual program that runs. So you have a program counter and it executes one instruction per cycle in a very deterministic way. And you can write those programs so you can get it to do things. So there are nine instructions, very, very small instructions, it's just nine instructions that you can use, 10 if you use the macro no-op, and we'll talk about more of that in a second. So let's have a look at the nine instructions so you get a feel of what you can do with this tiny little state machine, this tiny processor that can do programmed I.O. So the first instruction uh, is jump, and that's very simple. You're running a program when you want to jump to another place, and you can jump there always, just a mandatory jump, you can jump there depending if X or Y, those scratch registers uh, are zero. You can jump there if X and Y are not the same. You can jump there if a particular pin is actually set to be high. You can jump there if the input output, output shift register is not empty. And then for looping, you can actually decrement a value of X or a value of Y and then loop round jump if it's not zero. So that first instruction is basically a way of doing loops and jumping to different parts of the program depending on some conditions. Now, not a very wide range of conditions, you would get much more in a general processor. However, this is a good start being able to do a few things inside of your GPIO or PIO program. Next instruction is pretty simple, wait, so that's stall, do nothing until either a given GPIO pin is true or false, or there's an IRQ flag set. This is not a wait in terms of time, this is wait for an event to happen. The next instruction is shift, shift so many bits from a source place into this special register we talked about, the input shift register, and you can read that from the pins. So that basically means you can read things coming in from the pins. You can read it from X or Y, or you can read it from zero. You can also read in from the input shift register itself or from the output shift register. Now, one of the things about the PIO programming is basically if you, you can kind of read and write to just about anything, uh, input shift register, output shift register, to the pins, uh, back to the queue, because the idea is to be able to get as much I.O. going on, which means sending things and writing to things. So that's one good thing about this. So even that input into the shift register can read itself from the shift register. The next command is the out, which is exactly the same, except it's for the output shift register. And you can out from the output shift register to the pins, to X or Y. You can discard it from null. You can even write to the program counter, which is an interesting way of kind of doing a jump. You can actually also read from the input shift register. Next, you have two instructions for reading and writing from those two FIFO. So push, 
pushes the contents of the input shift register to the RX5 phone. It does that 32 bits at a time and clears the input shift register to zero. And there are some flags about whether it's full or not full. And then pulls does the opposite. It pulls from the TX FIFO into the output shift register. And again, there are some flags checking whether things are uh, empty or not and it blocks accordingly. So you've got these two push and pull, how you communicate with the outside world. So the actual program running on your Raspberry Pi Pico would push things into it and it would pull things out of it and you can get communication going on. And we'll look at this when we do some uh, demo programs uh, in a moment. There's also a move function. So you can copy things, let's say from X to Y or from the input shift register to the output shift register. So a way of moving things around internally inside of your state machine. You can actually set some flags for IRQ so that things can happen uh, when an, you can check to see something's happened according to an IRQ flag. And then there is a way of setting a, hard, a value. So you can set X to seven, for example, or you can set a pin to one, which would mean on. And that's the full nine instruction. And the 10th instruction, as I mentioned, is no op, do nothing, which basically does a move from Y to Y. So it takes some time, takes one cycle, uh, but doesn't do anything. Okay, now once you have all those instructions, you basically now have to write a small assembly program using those, load it into the state machine and then let it run. Now, the good news is that MicroPython has a slightly higher extraction of those instructions so that you can actually write all this stuff in Python without having to use the assembler. And there is an assembler included as part of the Pico SDK. So you can actually write these kind of programs in a text file, assemble them into the binary and then use a program to load those into the state machine. But MicroPython offers a slightly higher uh, abstraction, but not very high. You're still using pull and push and set and move and the input shift register and the output shift register, all that kind of stuff, but allows you to do it with inside Python. Okay, so what we're gonna do is go over to a Raspberry Pi Pico. We're going to start writing some programs in MicroPython that specifically program the uh, state machines and then let them run. And for, of course, for visual effect, we'll do something with LEDs so we can see what they're doing. But equally, the LED coming on could be a one being sent down a wire or a zero being sent. And so you can actually see how you can do communication with the outside world. Okay, let's head over to the desktop. Okay, so here we are inside of Thony. Thony, of course, is the IDE for Python that understands about the Raspberry Pi Pico. It's very easy to get uh, Python programs on and off the, uh, the device very simply, understands the file system and everything. You don't need to do anything complicated. So here is our very first PIO program. Probably this is about the shortest one you can create. So the first two statements are gonna be pretty much the same through any kind of uh, PIO program you write using MicroPython. That means you need to import the stuff that understands the Pico chip, the uh, RP2040, and you need to un import some stuff from machine which understands about the different pins because it's GPIO. These are things that normal Python wouldn't be interested in because of course Python is a general language, but when you're using MicroPython for a microcontroller, you can import these extra libraries. Now I'm gonna jump over this section just for a minute. We're gonna come back to it. Let's jump down to here. Now, as I explained, there are these different state machines, up to eight of them inside of the Raspberry Pi Pico's uh, processor. And basically every time you want to use one of those state machines, you use this state machine uh, class that is provided by this RP2 uh, library that we imported up here. So it basically says, I want to create access to a new state machine. Which state machine? Well, zero. And it could be one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven, depending on which one you are going to use. You can use multiple at once. You can define many of these. That's why in this example, I've put SM0, because you could define SM for state machine, of course, SM1, SM2, SM3. You could call it whatever you want. It's a good way of dividing them up. Now, the next parameter is the program that you want the PIO state machine to run. So I've just called it PIO prog. And if you notice, that's the name of this function we've defined up here. So these two have to be the same. We'll come back to that. And set base equal to pin 25. Basically says when I'm writing to a pin, I want it to start its sequence of pins. It can be a series of them at pin uh, 25 whenever the set command is used. And we'll talk more about this later on, specifically at the end. If you, if you get this wrong, then your program won't work and it can be quite frustrating to try to work out. We'll talk about that later in the video. So we've got these three arguments then, the state machine we're trying to configure, the program we want the state machine to run, and what pin you want it to use whenever you talk about writing or reading from a pin. 
And then what you do is to turn the state machine on, you basically say state machine zero, that's the one we defined, dot active one, switch it on. You can do active zero, which we'll see later on, to switch it off again if you wanted to. Now at this point, the Python program ends. There's nothing else here for the pro Python program to do, but the PIO starts running uh, in the background and will keep on uh, running, nothing will change. Now, let's have a look at these few strange lines here. Now, this one is obviously quite different than what you've seen before. The first thing it's saying here is that I want to make sure that the, uh, the, the initial state of the set pins is low. You can have low or you can have high. And basically, this command here is an inline assembler. So it's basically saying, I want you to do assemble the stuff, do the right things, so that we can actually have that happen at the assembly language level. So it's set in its state equal to low. And then we go into the program itself. Well, this is a fairly normal Python definition of a, of a function. However, this is not. This is something completely different. Now, this is the set instruction that we looked at earlier of those handful of instructions that you get for the uh, PIO programming. And it's the mapping of a, a, of a function inside of MicroPython to the actual low-level assembly command. And you're basically saying, write to pins, and we've defined that the base pin is pin 25. So effectively, write to pin 25, which of course the LED on the Pico board, uh, one. So in other words, turn the LED on. That's all we're doing in this program. We're using the programmed IO state machine to do one thing, and that one thing is just to turn on the GPIO. So if you run it, let's see what happens. And of course, it comes as no surprise that the LED switched on. Okay, let's look at a slightly more advanced program. Okay, this is one of the example programs that you can find in the uh, Raspberry Pi uh, Pico GitHub. I'll leave a link to it in the description below. And basically, it's a way of blinking an LED on and off using the uh, PIO. So let's just go down to the bottom. Here's the program, obviously. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Let's go down to the bottom. So same idea, a state machine is defined. It's exactly as the same as we did in our previous example, except for now we can also set the frequency. Now, by default, the frequency of the state machine is the frequency of the Pico chip itself, which is 125 megahertz. If you want something slower, then you can set the frequency here. However, it can only be the smallest you can do is 125 megahertz divided by 65536, which I think is actually 1908. So 2000 uh, is about the lowest that you can get it running at. Uh, if you want to run slower than that, then you actually need to slow the clock down on the Pico itself, and you can do that using uh, MicroPython. But running at its default clock speed, 2000 uh, is the lowest you can get to. Anyway, so we define this state machine, and here you can see, what do we do? We switch on the state machine, we uh, wait three seconds, and then we switch off the state machine. So that's pretty simple. Switch it on, let it do its thing, and then switch it off again. So what is the thing? Well, we can see here it's calling this function called blink, which is what we see uh, up here. So blink, again, is a MicroPython uh, PIO program, and it's not using normal kind of Python here. These are, again, the instructions that are part of the, uh, the MicroPython's handful of, of, of assembly instructions. So what happens here? Well, let's have a look. We'll ignore this first one for the moment. We'll come back to that. Sit pit, set pins to one. Well, we've done that before. We know that, does. that turns on the LED uh, on pin uh, GPIO 25, so that gets turned on. But what's this thing here? Well, one of the things you can do with the PIO is you can automatically add a delay a delay to the end of every instruction. And it can be up to 31 cycles because it, it stores this number as part of the instruction. And so it can only, there's only space for up to the 0 to 31. So you put in here 31. So it means for now for 31 cycles at 2 megahertz we've got there, it will do nothing. So it will do nothing for 31 cycles. Now that's not quite long enough for us to see the LED flashing. So what actually happens now is that for another four lot of instructions using the no-op, and the no-op is just a mapping to move Y to Y. Remember move is one of the instructions we looked at. Move Y to Y and 
so it does nothing because Y just gets written over again with Y, so nothing changes, but then delay for 31 cycles. And if you do that for enough of those in a row, you can create, manufacture uh, a delay. And then what you do is you say, now set the LED to zero. So you switch it on, then you switch it off. You switch it on, then you switch it off, and that's how you get the blinking program. And again, you need to delay using these no ops, each one of these having a 31 cycle delay uh, at the end. If you change this frequency here, it would mean these delays are shorter in real time because it's per cycle and, the, and it would actually flash quicker. Now we skipped over wrap target. Now basically when a program gets to the end of its uh, PIO instructions, it needs to do something and normally it jumps back up to the top and this is what this is saying. This is saying when you wrap, when you get to the end, wrap around to the beginning, then actually it's saying set the wrap target. So the set wrap target means go to here and here is the wrap. Now in this case, of course, it's going right back up to the very top of the program and that's fine. But you can actually do some other things uh, in here. You know, you could say set pins uh, zero. You don't need to, but you can do things before and they only happen once. So when it first comes into the function, it will execute whatever lines there are before the wrap target. Then you can say the wrap target and that becomes kind of like the main loop. So you can have a kind of initialization phase and then you can go through and run your main loop. In this case, it actually just loops rack around itself. So this will flash the LED. So let's run it and make sure that is exactly what happens. And as you can see there, it flashed the LED for three seconds because we activated the state machine, ran for three seconds, then we deactivated it. So it stopped doing the flashing that it was doing. So there you go. There is a program using a bit more of those uh, commands, a bit more of those assembly instructions for the program IO. Now really just switching an LED uh, on and off with a manufactured delay, just a hard delay of just like do nothing, do nothing for 31 cycles and for another 31 cycles. And it makes it flash on and off. Okay, let's move on to a bit more of a complicated program. Now, if you remember, there are two FIFOs. Uh, one for sending things into the state machine and one for sending things out of the state machine. And what I want to look at now is basically a program that whatever you send in gets sent out. So a very, very simple bounce program, in it goes, or an echo program, sometimes they get called, whatever you goes in uh, comes out. So we'll jump over our actual PIO program for the moment, but let's again see here where well, we create a state machine. Nothing surprising here causes this bounce. Uh, function frequency set to 2000 pin 25 which means it's basically it would be working on pin 25 but it doesn't actually do anything on this one it just sets things in and out but here down here this is the code that interests us so what we've we got here first of all we say in the state machine put the number 31 onto the txq so tx transmitting into the uh, into the uh, state machine Okay, and then what I do is I, I print out two things. I print out, you can ask it how many things are there in the FIFO, how many things are there in that queue. And so I say, please print out how many there are in the TX queue. Please print out how many things there are in the RX queue. And then I say, well, let's run the program, which is this program up here, which we'll look at in a minute. And let's just wait one second. And then we're going to stop running the program. And then I want to see how many are there on the input queue and how many are there on the output queue. And if there's something on the output queue, which I know there will be, let's get it to find out what the value is. Now, of course, what we're expecting if we're just doing this echo is that when we run it, there'll be one thing on the queue before the PIO starts running and there'll be nothing on the output queue. We then run it for just one second. And in that one second, the PIO will have bounced it back onto the output queue. That's the program we're going to look at in a moment. So therefore, the number of words in the FIFO queue will now be zero because it kind of got inputted. It got sucked in, pulled off, and then it actually writes it out again to the RX queue. So it then gets pushed onto that. And then we say, well, OK, let me tell me what it is. And then we read it. So basically, we're expecting 31 to pop out the other end, having gone into the state machine and come out of the state machine. Now, how do we do that? Well, here's our program. Again, very simple, pull, pulls off something from the TX FIFO and puts it into a register called OSR, the output shift register. Remember, that's one of the registers that's in the PIO. We then use the move instruction, one of the uh, assembly instructions, and we say move the contents of the OSR into the ISR. And the ISR is the input uh, shift register. And then push automatically pushes whatever's in the input shift register onto the RX uh, FIFO. 
So Paul pulls it from the TX FIFO into the OSR. The OSR is then copied over to the ISR and then push pushes whatever from the ISR back onto the RX FIFO. So let's see what happens when we run the program. Okay, so what do we see? The number of words in the TXQ is one. That's correct. That's what we'd expect. It's the number 31 we put in there. And there's nothing in the output queue, the RXQ. We then run, wait for one second, then stop. And now it's inverse. The number of words in the input queue TX FIFO are zero because it got pulled into the PIO. But the number of words in the output queue is now one. And then we say, we'll get it from the out from the RX and it's 31. So we put 31 in. We did something with it in the FIFO and then we kind of output it out again on the other side. So now you can see you can get things into the FIFO and out to the FIFO. So imagine if you were writing a program that was sending some numbers over uh, the serial, over uh, you know, I squared C, over SPI, you can say, please send the number 27, and it would know then how to do that with all the bits going up and down, bit banging, they're calling it, all the bits going up and down in the right sequence, so that protocol is understood at the physical level. So now we can get things in and out, and if there's a reply that comes back, we can get that out again to the calling program, and now you have full communication going on via the PIO machine and the, the pins that it's controlling. So let's develop a little bit this uh, program that sends things in on the FIFO and then does something and sends it out. Last time we just copied it out, it was a bounce, an echo. Now we're gonna write a function called double it. So we're still gonna send in 31, we're still gonna check the queues, we're gonna let the program run for one second, and then we're gonna fetch the result out again. But now we're going to double it rather than just echo the number back out. Now a clever thing you can do in binary is if you shift a number to the left, then you double it. So if you had one in binary, you shift it to the left, you get two. If you have two and you shift it to the left, you get four. And if you have four and you shift it to the left, you get eight. So you double it every time. That's actually the nature of binary. So we can actually do something here to double a number just by shifting it to the left. So what we're gonna do, in our PIO program, we pull what's on the TX FIFO into the OSR. And then we use this in function which basically is a way of putting things into the ISR by rotating it a certain number of, shifting it a certain number of bits. So what we're saying is go into the ISR from the OSR and we want to do that 32 times, 32 bits. So it'll basically shift in the numbers uh, by 32. We could have done it using a, a move, for example. I just wanted to show you a different command here, in in this case, because in is bitwise. If I just did this like eight, or two, it would only do it by two bits or by eight bits. It didn't have, you don't have to do it with the whole word, but we do it with 32. And I also wanted to note that because there's actually a keyword called in inside of Python, you have to use in underbar, note in underbar, not in. Okay, that's just because it, so it doesn't clash with the actual language of Python itself. And then what I do is I set uh, X to have zero in it. And then what I do is I shift the input shift register again by one using uh, what's in X, and I do it by one bit. So effectively, it's gonna shift everything that's in the input shift register, which is in fact what we pulled off the TX FIFO. We shift it uh, to the left once. And obviously there's overflow situations here. If you had a 31 bit number and then you shifted it, you'd start to get overflow. But if we start in something like 31, that's not going to be a problem. Okay, so let's give it a go. Okay, so the program runs similarly as before. How many words are there on the TX FIFO? There's one. On the RX FIFO, there's zero. We run the program. We wait one second. We stop it. There's nothing on the TX FIFO anymore because it got taken into our program. And now there is something on the RX FIFO. And what is it? It's 62. Hooray! 31 times by 2, of course, is 62. Okay, here is another new program. And in this time, I want to show you that you can actually execute commands on the uh, the state machine in a bespoke manner, just by saying execute this command on the state machine. So what do we do? We'll ignore this bit for the moment, but what do we do? We create a state machine as per normal, uh, running a function called prog, which we'll talk about in a minute, and we set pin 25. And then what you can actually say is sm.execute, uh, exec, okay, and you say set pins to one. So it's the same as what we wrote in our very first program, but now we're doing it kind of in line, and this will actually assemble this to the right machine code instructions, send it to the machine and just execute those instructions. And then we can say, sleep for half a second, and then we can say, set the pins to zero. So what we're actually doing is, this is a way of setting the pins 
to one and zero, turning it on and off just by calling the set function in line without actually writing an actual program that runs. And we'll actually see, we'll run it in a second, that it will just come on for half a second. And the way you do this here is that when you write this prog, which is what's defined here in the state machine, you use this uh, construct they have in Python called pass, which basically means I, I might put something in here later. I need to put this null, really, but it's syntactically correct. So this is a program, a function that does nothing. It just passes. In other words, it's correct. OK, so this program does absolutely nothing, uh, but it need, you need this parameter. You can't not put this parameter in. So we're basically putting in a dummy function to make it happen. And then we're kind of talking to the state ex the state machine uh, individually ourselves by running these individual instructions. And this is really handy also for debugging because if you say to yourself, oh, can I just uh, do this quick thing here at this point and kind of try to get something out of the state machine or set something in the state machine, change the value of X, change the value of Y, you can do all that kind of in line by using that Python program. Okay, let's run it and see what happens. And as you saw there, we get one flash, it just goes on and then switches off again. Okay, now that we know how to send data into the the, uh, the PIO, the state machine, we know how to turn pins on and off with that. Wouldn't it be good if we send it some numbers in and whatever numbers we send in, it flashes the LED according to the ones and the zeros of the number that we put in. And that's exactly what we're gonna do here. So basically, again, we define a state machine. The function is called blink pull because it's pulling it off the FIFO. And we're making sure that it is a shift to the right that happens. And I'm setting base pin 15 in this case, which is actually just one that I've got uh, wired up to a different LED. Let's just, you know, jazz things up a bit here. I'm using a different LED to make things a bit different. Of course, the idea, of course, showing that you can use any GPIO pin uh, as defined on the Raspberry Pi Pico. We set it running, no problem at all. And then we go around here in an infinite loop putting onto the FIFO this number, which is basically zero, all low bunch of zeros or ones, 15 bits as it were of zeros and a one, 15 bits of zeros and then a one. So basically it's gonna have 15 loads of zeros and then a one, 15 loads of zeros and a one. So you're kind of gonna get a flashing going on. And if you change that number to other things, you can get different patterns. What does the program itself do? Well, we set the wrap target in the wrap, so that just means it just goes round and round and round and round forever. Pull basically pull something off the FIFO. Now, by the way, a thing we're not going to go too much into now is there are mechanisms for knowing whether the FIFO is full, whether it, there's stuff to be pulled off. Basically, the default is that it blocks. So when it says pull here, it'll wait until this program actually has actually got round to put something on it. And this will just keep trying to put it on. And this will block when the FIFO is full. And this will wait until there's something to pull off the FIFO. So it's all synchronized by the fact that it knows whether there's something there or not. Okay, once we've pulled off the number from the FIFO, we now want a loop to go through all those bits. So we set this to 31, we set X to 31, and you'll see why in a moment. We then define a label so we can do a jump, and it's called bit loop, and you can see that's used down here with the jump. We'll get to that in a minute. And what we basically say is, and what this command does, it outputs to the pins, in this case, pin 15, one bit worth by using shifting to the right, because it's the output shift register, remember is what's on the, it gets pulled out, so the output shift register, that's why it's called that. Okay, it shifts it to the right one, and whatever that number is, whether it's a one or a zero, it writes that to GPIO pin 15, and then it waits a delay of 31 cycles. So basically, if there's a one in the next bit, it's gonna turn it on, if there's a zero, it's gonna turn it off. And then there's this nice jump here that jumps back round to here, so it basically just does the next out, but there's this clever thing here and it basically says decrement X and keep going if it's not zero. So this has a special meaning, decrement decrease X by one and then jump around if it's not zero. So basically we get a loop that goes around all the bits here. And then once that's happened, it wraps around, pulls the next number off and does it again. Okay, so let's run the program and see what happens. And as we can see there, the program flash. Let's get rid of the one there. So we're going to have more zeros and less ones. Let's run that and see what happens. And as you can see there, that flashed less uh, frequently because we're sending uh, more zeros and less ones. And you could put whatever you like in. And of course, you can imagine this is again demonstrating how if you actually wanted to communicate over some lines to some other devices, I squared, C, S, P, I, U, R, whatever, then you can actually send things into the machine and actually get it to send them across. In fact, there is a UART example 
uh, that you will find uh, on the GitHub repository, for the examples from the Raspberry Pi. And again, the link, same as before, is in that description, is in the description below. Now we've just about come to the end of all the programs that I wanted to show you, which I hope this has given you a good idea of how you can use this. However, I, in my kind of playing around with this, did come uh, stuck uh, once, and I wanted to point it out to you to make sure that you don't have the same problem. Now, if you look here, this looks like a, a fairly okay program. We define a state machine, pin 25, we turn it active, and what does the program do? It just sets pin 25 to one. But the problem is we're using set, and in here we've used out, and down here we've used out. In fact, if you run this program, you won't get anything at all. There'll be no flashing LEDs. There'll be no LEDs going on or off at all, but there are also no error messages. There's nothing to say that you've configured the PIO, the, uh, the state machine incorrectly. So this should be a set, and this should be a set because we're using set here. Now in my debugging and in my playing around, I've switched between set and out and and I kind of like, and if you change the method that you're using set rather than out, rather than using the output shift register, you're just using explicit set, then you've got to remember to set these. So maybe it's kind of a tip, you should always set, you know, the uh, set and the out. You should always use set and out. You should always define set and out here. So you make sure you're using uh, the right pins. Just a bit of a gotcha. Uh, it took me a little bit of head scratching till I worked out, oh, I just changed and I didn't, oh, silly me. So just so that you don't fall into the same pit. Okay, that's it. My name's Gary Sims and this is Gary Explains. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do consider giving it a thumbs up. And if you like these kind of videos, well then stick around by subscribing to the channel. Don't forget you can follow me on Twitter at Gary Explains and I also have a monthly newsletter. Go over to GaryExplains.com, type in your email address, no spam, but you will get the email. Okay, that's it. I'll see you in the next one.